And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Jenny Shen. Jenny is uh, the, the co-chair of our U.S. PDOPS uh, North American Advisory uh, uh, Committee, uh, along with, M with Mar Marty Schreier uh, as well. And Dr. Shen is, uh, is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the David Geffen uh, School of Medicine at, at UCLA and uh, practices at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for, for presenting uh, today. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I just wanted to make a note that PDOPS is really, really possible by international support and collaboration between a variety of academic research institutions as well as industry sponsors. So we're very grateful to everybody who's been helping us move forward with this project. Next slide. A little bit of background. So Arbor Research is conducting PDOPS in close collaboration with the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, or ISPD. And it's really centered around ISPD wanting to understand and identify modifiable practices that might improve peritoneal dialysis. So the thought is to really extend PD technique survival and improve survival and quality of life for PD patients so we can see if we can get more people on PD and then have them stay longer on PD as well. Next slide. We have a number of different work groups that are really centered around the clinical challenges that we're facing in PD. As you can see, there are groups looking at infection, at catheter function, and so on. And the U.S. Advisory Panel, um, as uh, was mentioned on one of the co-chairs, the U.S. Advisory Panel is really focused on the specific challenges in the U.S. that we have um, because of the different policies and practice patterns that we have here. And so this work group is really focused on developing research interests that will specifically improve the practice of PD in the United States. Next slide. So again, the primary outcome that we're focusing on in PDOPS is looking at all-cause PD technique failure. So why is it that people do not um, last as long in PD as we would like? Secondary outcomes, of course, would be looking at all-cause mortality, um, but also teasing out what are the cause-specific um, PD technique failure rates. So is it you know, infection-related, mostly catheter-related, mechanical-related, and so on. Of course, we'll also be looking at PD-related complications, chief among them hospitalizations and infections. Um, one of the things that we're starting to expand is also patient-reported outcomes, which I think everybody has a growing understanding of the importance of that as well as, of course, looking at some secondary laboratory measurements as well. Next slide. And for more details on all the design and uh, conduct of PDOS, you can take a look at the methods paper that was first authored by Jeff Pearl. It came out in PDI last year, and the citation there is uh, in the corner there. Next slide. So this is the facility participation in PDOS phase one. And you can see that right now we're involving the United States and includes the large dialysis organizations, or LDOs, as well as non-LDOs. Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and Thailand have all been participating. And you can see that in the United States, two-thirds of the facilities are coming from the LDOs, and about a third are from the LDOs. And just a note here, basically, these facilities were randomly selected within certain strata in the particular countries, and to be included, each facility had to have at least 20 patients, 20 PD patients at the time of inclusion. Next slide. And here you can see the actual number of patients that are enrolled as opposed to just the facilities. And again, from the US LDOs, we have 3,000 patients involved, and then non-LDOs, we have about 1,000. And 1,000 is you know, pretty much how much we're getting from Canada, Japan, uh, the numbers from Australia, UK, New Zealand, and Thailand are a little bit lower than that. Next slide. But we do have to keep in mind that this is in context that phase one went through, um, I think it pretty much just ended the middle of 2017, and we're going to be uh, starting off with phase two now. So the main differences with phase two is we're certainly going to support the current PDOPS countries, um, but we're also going to be expanding to South Korea and Colombia, which is pretty exciting. Also in phase two, we're going to be oversampling incident patients. This will really help us dig into the reason for early attrition rates. And also in phase two, we're really looking to position the structure of PDOPS to support ancillary projects. So anybody who's interested in collaborating with PDOPS uh, to you know, extend any of the studies or you know, start phase of your own, please definitely reach out to us. 
Next slide. So here we really want to focus in on the key findings and the differences between the U.S. and internationally in PD practice. Next slide. And this is a slide from the U.S. RDS, and I think most of us have realized that we're really experiencing a trend of increasing use of PD in the United States. So here you can see the years on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is the number of incident patients that are being started on um, all home dialysis, home hemodialysis. But you know the main thing we're going to be looking at is in yellow uh, peritoneal dialysis. Right around 2008, 2009, uh, the incidence of PD really took off. So that just makes PDOPS even more relevant in the United States here where the practice is growing. Next slide. So first, I want to take a look at the facility characteristics and PD prescription variation that we've been picking up in PDOPS. Next slide. So here is just a look at the facility size distribution in PDOPS. This is just initial cross-section um, from 2014 to 2017. And um, here you can see that the U.S., the trend is that the U.S tends to have um, smaller units compared to some of the other countries with the exception of Japan. I mean, Japan, nearly half of their units are 20 to 29 in their census. Again, this is with the caveat that, remember, all the centers that we were capturing in PDOPS are going to have at least 20 patients. So we're not going to be looking at the very, very small centers that have um, less than 20 patients. Next slide. There is a number of facility characteristics that are noted on this table, but I just want to point out a couple of key differences between the United States and the rest of the countries that we're seeing. The first striking thing is really in the United States, we're looking at very few facilities that are located within the hospital. And in the United States, as opposed to all the other countries, we're looking at more of an outpatient structure for delivery of peritoneal dialysis. There also seems to be a lower physician to patient ratio um, which I think is interesting. And uh, similarly, PD nurses tend to be PD-only nurses. That is, the PD nurses that are um, caring for our patients, um, not a lot of them are also caring for hemodialysis patients as well. And that's something that's uh, not as common in some of the other countries. The other thing is, uh, and this probably is due to the nature, the outpatient nature of a lot of our facilities, there aren't a lot of laboratory programs on site in the U.S. when you compare it to the other countries in the study. Next slide. When you take a look at patient characteristics, there's also, again, I just want to bring your attention to a few key differences. Uh, the first thing is in the United States, we tend to have fewer older patients compared to the other countries, with the exception of Thailand. Um, you know, perhaps this is due to the lower provision of assisted PD in our country. Right now, it's a little bit unclear. I think we're trying to dig into the data there. Um, I think consistent with population-wide um, comparisons among countries. In the U.S., the BMI for PD patients uh, tends to be quite a bit higher uh, than the other countries, um, you know, even than Canada, which is just across the border. And you can see that more than half of our patients have diabetes. Really, Thailand is the only one that comes close to the prevalence of diabetes in our population. Next slide. Here we're looking at PD type, and to clarify, APD is automated PD, or PD which is delivered almost exclusively by a cycler, and CAPD is continuous ambulatory PD. And you can see here there's um, a difference where in the United States, we're predominantly using APD as the modality here rather than CAPD. And the big um, difference on the other side of the spectrum would be Thailand, where almost all of their patients are getting PD using CAPD. Next slide. Digging more into labs, if you look at the distribution of total KT over V, you can see in the US, our patients are trending with higher KT over V. Um, there are you know, a variety of reasons that this might be. I think some have speculated, is it because that the reimbursement of dialysis here in the United States is very urea-based, and that might drive us towards higher KT over V um, as opposed to other countries um, again, it's all speculations a little unclear uh, at this time. Next slide. I think the important thing to remember, though, where maybe reimbursement is mostly based on um, urea and small cellular clearance, you want to consider that adequacy in all dialysis is really a multidimensional um, beast. And so there's not, there are many other issues that are going to be influencing outcomes in our patients. 
any of the fields where we need to move forward to um, be more inclusive when we think about assessing how well we're delivering dialysis. This is a great figure that's from a CJSN article that was led by the ASN um, Dialysis Practice Group. And it's just really um, emphasizing that we want to also look not just at the PT review, but how we're doing in terms of patient-reported outcomes in managing their fluid status, um, how we're managing their heart rate and their blood pressure as well. And so that's something to keep in mind moving forward as well. Next slide. So this poll question is, if you felt that your patient on PD would benefit from the use of eicodextrin, how easy do you think it would be for you to obtain? Very easy, easy, difficult, or very difficult? You can go ahead and put in your answer now. Okay, it looks like we have about close to 50 people who've responded so far to the poll. And it looks like 35% find it to be difficult, which is pretty much on par with 33% or a third that also find that it's easy. Um, a quarter of patients, uh, sorry, a quarter of those polls find it to be very easy, and only 7% found it to be very difficult. So we want to ask this poll question because we took a look at eicodextrin use in PDOPS. Next slide. And this is actually what we found. So Thailand, uh, virtually nobody is using eicodextrin use there. Um, and that might be a financial issue, eicodextrin being uh, rather costly. But if you look at the United States, and the uh, United States financially is pretty much comparable to the other countries that we're looking at here, Canada, UK, et cetera. Um, only 22% of our patients are using eicodextrin, mm. and that's definitely um, far below the rates that we see in the other countries, which are in the 42 to 55% range. So um, I think it's interesting. Uh, you could definitely see there's a big, broad range in the 50 people who responded to the poll, but um, you know, third found it to be difficult. Of course, half of, the, half of um, us also found it to be easier, very easy, but. Um, it's definitely a striking difference that was seen in PDOPS in the U.S. versus the other countries. Next slide. So when we look at uh, the number of overnight exchanges for APD patients, again, patients who are on the cycler, um, you take a look here. In the U.S., uh, and this is on par with most of the other countries, it looks like there's a high number of overnight exchanges being prescribed. So, um, for example, you know, looking again at the United States, um, half of the patients, a little over half the patients are getting um, four or less exchanges, but then um, almost half are getting five or more exchanges. And if you think about uh, very short exchanges, um, so when you have very short exchanges, that might be quite effective for small cellular clearance and also be, you know, advantageous for people who are fast transporters, but I think there needs to be thoughts about how this might be impacting middle and large molecule clearance for example, when you're looking at trying to manage FOSS risk. Um, but again, the United States, it's really a, a trend that we're seeing in the other countries as well, with the exception of, um, I'm sorry, with the exception of Japan there. Japan there tend to use uh, fewer exchanges than other countries. But it was something that was striking when we took a look. Next slide. The next session, we're really going to take a look at peritonitis treatment and prevention strategies. And there is an infection prevention and management work group who has been focused on this. They actually submitted an abstract to EDTA in 2016. Next slide. So how often does your PD program review rates of PD-related infections for the purpose of continuous quality improvement? Never, every one to three months, every four to six months, every seven to 12 months, every one to two years, or less often than every two years? Okay. 
Okay. Well, it looks like um, the vast majority of the respondents are reviewing the PD-related infections every one to three months. Uh, so that's fantastic. And then there's a smattering of recipients here who are reviewing them every four to six months, every seven to 12 months, and 2% are reviewing them every one to two years. So moving forward, uh, let's take a look now at peritoni peritonitis uh, prevention strategies. So in terms of exit site antimicrobial prophylaxis, again, really um, digging down into differences that we saw in the U.S. versus other countries, 72% of U.S. facilities are using immunoglycoside uh, as their exit site antimicrobial prophylaxis. This might be due to the fact that there is um, an RCT that was done looking at gentamicin versus mepiracin, and they found that gentamicin was um, superior to mepiracin. That was done by Beth Pirano here in the United States. So it's possible that the dissemination of that research was broader in the United States versus other countries. And while there hasn't been any signal of any emergence of uh, immunoglycoside resistance quite yet, it will be interesting to see um, in the future if there's a potential complication that might arise um, in the United States versus other countries. Now, another striking difference that you'll see is that certainly in Japan, um, most people don't use, um, most facilities do not use any exit site antimicrobial prophylaxis at all. So in Japan, interestingly, there's no promotion of this um, exit site um, prophylaxis, and in keeping with that, there's no reimbursement for it at all. So that's very different from the other countries. Um, Thailand, 73% also are not using any prophylaxis. Next slide. This is a look at antifungal prophylaxis during antibiotic therapy. And the United States is you know, pretty much in the middle ground in terms of antifungal use. So almost half of facilities um, do not provide antifungal prophylaxis but 43%, um, about the same percentage, will pre uh, prescribe antifungal prophylaxis during prolonged or broad-spectrum antibiotic use. And then about 10% um, will give it for short or any antibiotic courses. Now, this is um, very striking. Australia and New Zealand really stand up from the pack in this case, where nearly three-quarters of facilities are giving antifungal prophylaxis for all antibiotic courses. So they're very consistent with providing that antifungal prophylaxis. I would note that Australia and New Zealand they did have a call to action a few years ago in terms of um, really getting all facilities um, nationally um, in line in terms of peritonitis prevention and treatment. And I think that's very well reflected in the antifungal prophylaxis patterns that we see here. Next slide. Now, the interesting thing is Despite all the variation in terms of peritonitis prevention strategies that we just noted uh, between and among countries, really the, the striking in peritonitis rates that we're seeing here is there's much greater variation that we're seeing between facilities, not so much between countries. So to orient you a little bit, um, the ranks are on the x-axis. Um, the y-axis here is the peritonitis rate, and the bars are the 95% confidence interval, and it's expressed as uh, peritonitis events per patient year. And there are different colors uh, for each country. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter what you know, color goes with which country. The important thing to see is you don't see any clustering of colors in any particular section. So it's not that one particular country is ranked very low or particularly high compared to the other countries. So again, we're seeing a lot of variation in peritonitis rates between facilities, um, but not so much uh, among countries. Next slide. On the other hand, there are definitely signals in terms of differences in the events that are associated with the peritonitis episodes. And the key thing is in the United States um, and as well as in Canada, only about half of our patients are hospitalized during peritonitis episodes. You can see in the other countries, they're running more mm -hmm. in the 60 to 70% range. So much more patients in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Thailand, and the UK are being hospitalized during the peritonitis episodes. I think, again, this is very in line with the data that we saw earlier with the ways that our facilities are set up. It's much more of an outpatient-based uh, delivery of PD um, that we're seeing here in the United States. It looks like that's true in terms of managing peritonitis as well. But interestingly, if you look at the two uh, lines below that, PD catheter removed, 
as well as death within 90 days of diagnosis, the United States um, does not have a higher uh, rate of removal. In fact, it's pretty much the lowest rate of removal. And deaths also were on the lower end in terms of death rate. So even though most of our patients, or not as many of our patients, are being hospitalized during the peritonitis episode, this is not translating into worse outcomes for our patients. Um, I would make a note um, for Thailand, we noted a 21% death within 90 days of diagnosis for peritonitis. Uh, that could be a bit skewed because of the low um, end uh, in that country. Next slide. So next, we wanted to take um, just a quick look at variability in peritonitis dialysis patient training. Uh, we have the patient training and ed education work group, and they presented um, uh, some of this data at ASN last year. Next slide. So what is the average duration of patient training prior to PD initiation in your units uh, for you practice? Two to three days, four to five days, six to seven days, or more than seven days? I love this dynamic polling. You can see how the percentages change by second. So it looks like a solid 41% of those polled here today are training their patients for about four to five days. That seems to be about a work week uh, prior to PD initiation. A quarter of um, those polled are training for a little bit longer, six to seven days. And 23% are training for more than seven days before starting PD initiation. And by contrast, only 9% of people polled here today are only having their patients trained two to three days before starting PD initiation. Next slide. So here we're taking a look. We asked that question because in the PDOS, um, we did ask, when does PD training typically occur in reference to PD catheter insertion? And if you look here in um, Japan, they're kind of on the far side of the spectrum where 62% of facilities are training their uh, patients even prior to PD catheter insertion, which I thought was very interesting because then if you look at the U.S., um, and it's very similar in Canada and Australia as well, um, very few, only 3% are being trained before the catheter even gets put in. 50% um, are being trained two weeks after, 20% um, about one week after here in the United States. I think what you're seeing here in the United States, um, really it looks like the trend is more to be training the patients um, after the PD catheter has been placed and even presumably after it's had some time to heal after about two weeks when it's ready to go. Again, the United States is pretty much running in the middle of the pack here, um, maybe a little bit less in terms of not uh, delivering a lot of training prior to it. But again, Japan you see is a big standout here. Next slide. The other thing that was looked at is where are patients being trained? Um, so again, in Japan, 100% are only being trained in the facilities. The United States is kind of in the middle, 60%, um, two-thirds maybe in the facility, um, but 40% are actually a combination of home and facility. Um, and in the UK, actually, you'll see 16% are exclusively trained at home. Next slide. And finally, the, uh, the very interesting thing that this all leads up to is, what about peritoneal dialysis attrition? So these are preliminary uh, results from the PDOPS, um, and the work group that worked on this was a clinical application of PD therapy work group. Next slide. And here uh, you can see the attrition in the first 120 days, or about four months, of starting dialysis. And it ranges from a low of 2.5% of patients who discontinue due to death or changing to hemodialysis uh, within 120 days in Japan to a high of 13% in the US. So there's a lot of variation between countries, certainly. It's a little bit hard right now to draw conclusions specific to the countries. Uh, the countries that we see that are running a little bit higher, um, they also are the ones that were enrolled earlier and then we have a bit more data on. Um, 
so some of the other countries have lower N. But interesting thing to point out, though, if you look at the bottom, you can see um, the percentage of attrition from death or change to HD, and then a change to HD. And so the difference between the two numbers would be the mortality. And the mortality rates in the first 120 days um, is, pretty, is pretty low. So we're looking at maybe 3 to 5 percent here. In phase two, where we're oversampling for incident patients, we'll be able to really uh, tease that data out more. So now we're going to take a look at contemporary anemia management. Next slide. And here we look at hemoglobin categories by countries. And the take home point here is you'll see the hemoglobin spreads are pretty comparable to what we're seeing in hemodialysis, although we're achieving these levels with less epigen use. Next slide. Now, earlier we had seen the recent trends in epigen use and type. Um, a note about this slide here this is a cross sectional look. Um, and you'll see that the use of pegylated epigen is pretty low in all countries with the exception of Japan. And darbo use is pretty low in the United States, um, as well as in Thailand. But again, uh, we're looking at cross-section, and if we broke it up by years that patients, uh, years in terms of calendar years, it's possible we might see a similar trend where U.S. pegylated epigen would be on the rise. Next uh, slide. Certainly in terms of ferritin, the standout here is Thailand and the United States definitely trending higher ferritin levels than the other countries. This might be because in the United States, the um, range of acceptable ferritin, the ceiling, tends to be a bit higher than other countries. Next slide. And I think that ties in with the higher use of IV iron that you'll see in the United States here um, versus other countries. In Australia and New Zealand, 80% of patients actually aren't in, uh, on any iron at all, whereas almost half of our patients are on IV iron here in the U.S. Next slide. So patient reported outcomes, next slide. So we just wanted to give a quick taste of this because there's much more of this to come. Here we're looking at the SF12, the physical health composite and mental health composite scores among countries. And there's not much of a difference in terms of mental health composite scores among countries. If you look at the physical health composite scores, Japan does seem to be trending um, a little higher than the other countries there. But again, this is um, more to come in terms of patient-reported and patient-centered outcomes. Next slide. So again, uh, just to conclude, in the US, it looks like our clinics tend to be uh, less likely to be located in a hospital. Our nurses tend to be treating only PD patients more. Our patients tend to have higher TT or V while eicodectrin use is lower. We're definitely seeing trends of higher ferritin levels in IV iron use, as well as higher immunoglycoside use for exocyte prophylaxis. And right now, at least preliminary data, we have the highest rate of loss of PD patients in the first 120 days. Now, the facility level variation of peritonitis rates is very striking, much more striking than changes among countries. And looking forward, again, we're going to be expanding in scope in the number of countries and patient-reported outcomes. And of course, we welcome ancillary studies. Thanks so much. These are just uh, highlighting some Kidney Week presentations that we'll have for those of you who will be going to the ASN. If you want to drop by and take a look and listen to these presentations to learn more about PDOPS and some of our results. So thank you very much. Jenny, uh, thank you so very much for, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we really do appreciate that. And, and uh, just as you noted at the very start, Clearly, a substantial rise in PD use, um, um, uh, in particularly new PD users, but also uh, in the U.S., substantial early loss uh, as well, uh, actually 15% over 90 days. So, great. I think in general, really good news that we're using more PD. Still have some room room to, uh, to improve with that with respect to outcomes, and a lot more work to do with respect to PDOPS to help um, elaborate on on. on practices that are that are ultimately in affecting outcomes. So Jenny, thank you once again. One other question that we had uh, is, um, is the ferritin level lower in PD than HD? And I can take that. Uh, it is actually a bit lower in PD patients compared to HD, though not a lot lower. The um, Median ferritin level among HD patients in the U.S. is is over 800 uh, uh, nanograms per mL, whereas in peritoneal dialysis, it, it's to my recollection in the low 700s. 
um, so a bit lower in PD, but not a lot lower. Um, we do, and, and as Jenny noted, much higher actually in the U.S. than in other countries for both PD and HD patients. And it, um, I think a lot more needs to be done with respect to understanding the implications of that. And do we really need to be driving ferritin levels as high as we are? Um, uh, uh, you know, if ultimately, of course, the goal is to, to support hemoglobin levels. And we saw cross-sectionally that hemoglobin levels in the U.S. are pretty comparable to other countries. Um, and yet we are giving folks a lot more iron uh, uh, overall. So some additional work to do in, in that vein, and thank you for that question. <laughs>